Hello everybody and welcome to our next lecture of 6837. Today we're going to continue our discussion of physically based animation by talking about mass spring modeling and advanced solvers for ordinary differential equations or ODEs. Uh, today's lecture is essentially a continuation of the previous one uh, to more complicated physical models uh, and then coming up with better numerical techniques that can handle the complexity of these models. So this will be pretty much the end of the first chunk of our course. And then we're going to move on to talking about rendering, which of course is a big part of any graphics class. So with that, let's uh, get started with a little bit of review from last time. Uh, so remember that in our previous lecture, we spent most of our time talking about ordinary differential equations and numerical integration. So remember that an ordinary differential equation is essentially uh, an equation for where you're trying to find a function x of t, right? So x is the state of your system and t is time. You're given an initial uh, value for your uh, system. So for example, maybe I'm simulating physics and I know the initial velocities and positions of a bunch of particles. And the task in solving an ODE, at least the initial value problem version of an ODE, is to integrate forward and find x of t for t bigger than t naught, uh, which is where the initial conditions are specified. Now, in our previous lecture, uh, we talked about a lot of different tricks for solving ODEs and reducing them to simpler forms. So the basic uh, idea that really motivated a lot of the algorithms that we talked about uh, was the reduction to first order. So the basic trick here is that Newton's method, or rather not Newton's method, uh, Newton's laws, uh, tell us uh, that mass moves around um, and particles interact with one another um, in a second derivative fashion, right? By following this F equals MA relationship, remember that A stands for acceleration, it's the second derivative of position with respect to time, we can essentially trace the motion of particles forward in time given their initial condition using an ODE. But the ODE is second order. So what that means, the order of an ordinary differential equation is the highest derivative that appears in the relationship, right? So in order to solve F equals MA for uh, our function X of T, um, we need to kind of undo two different derivatives that are sitting in our equation system. But if you look at our previous slide, notice that I defined an ODE to be a first order object. I suppose actually that's not great terminology. An ODE is just any equation involving, you know, a function and its derivatives. Uh, but we specifically focused on ODEs that are first order, right? That only involve one derivative in time. So to get around that, we made a uh, nice observation, which is that we can take a high order system of ODE, remember order refers to the number of derivatives, and we can replace it with a low order system of ODE, but there's no free lunch. Uh, what we have to pay is in the dimensionality of our problem. So in particular, uh, if we're working with Newton's laws, we can take what was a second order system of ODEs, and make it into a first order system of ODEs by using the uh, trick given on the slide here. Now, the basic idea is that we're going to expand F equals MA into two relationships. Namely, the first relationship says the derivative of position is velocity. And then the second relationship is our F equals MA, it's just hiding in disguise, right? So rather than having A as acceleration, we're thinking of acceleration as the first derivative of velocity. And so if we put these two relations together and say we're gonna solve for x and v simultaneously, um, this is equivalent to solving f equals ma, but now there's only one derivative. Now, we should look at this critically, right? Because somehow we just introduced a trick that got rid of higher order derivatives altogether, but from calculus class that should feel fishy because more derivatives somehow feels like more work. Uh, and so the conservation of work here is that we have a low order problem, but now we have two times the variables, right? X and V. Okay, so that's sort of where we left off in terms of uh, definitions. One of the nice things about reducing an ODE to first order is that we can think of it as tracing a path through a vector field, right? So here, um, if we think of, usually we think of it in kind of a stationary way, like we don't think of that T variable being there. 
then take a look at our ODE uh, uh, relationship here, right? What it's saying is that I can get the velocity of x by evaluating a function that's only a function of x. Now, I crossed out time, so this would work for things like springs, which like don't depend on time, but if there were like some external force, this visualization wouldn't work as well. But it's just that, it's just a visualization. So why uh, do we kind of like this relation? So if we think of uh, this space here as being the space of x values, then essentially what this formula is telling us is that if we sit at some point, by evaluating the function f, it kind of gives us an arrow, which is telling us how x wants to change. So if we scatter a bunch of points all over the plane and evaluate f, which is exactly what we've done in this admittedly uh, pixelated visualization here, what we get is an object called a vector field. Uh, and essentially the vector field is just telling you how x wants to change. And then integrating an ODE is essentially just tracing out a path in that vector field. Okay, so this visualization is nice for a few reasons. Unfortunately, it only works for very low uh, dimensional ODE, right? Above three, it would be pretty hard to use this. But uh, what it allows us to do is to think of our ODE integration algorithms as just different ways of approximating this pink path that I've drawn for you on the screen here. And so, for example, uh, in our last lecture, we talked about Euler's method. Uh, sometimes we also call uh, it forward Euler, where what we would do is evaluate f, which gives that straight line. And then rather than somehow take a curved path, we're going to take a straight line path by scaling it by some constant h to get our next step. So Euler's method is a totally reasonable fashion to solve an ODE, but it also has a lot of drawbacks. Um, and we kind of alluded to this a little bit in the last lecture, and today we're really going to expand on that discussion. Um, namely, Euler's method, uh, oftentimes we say that it is unstable as a method to solve ODE. Incidentally, if I catch any of you people calling it Euler's method, you're going to lose lots of credit in this class and any other class that I teach to you. It, uh, his name is uh, Euler. But in any event, Let's think about uh, the following ODE. Now, this is a first order differential equation. So I suppose uh, implicitly here, what we're solving is the dx dt equals minus kx. So first of all, let's, let's think about what this equation kind of looks like. So let's assume that k is a positive number uh, so that you know, your instructor doesn't go crazy with uh, sign mistakes. So then uh, this ODE is essentially telling us, okay, so when, uh, so let's think of, of time, uh, well, so right, so when, when x is, is positive, it's saying that x wants to decrease, x is negative, it's saying that x wants to increase, right? That's essentially uh, what this ODE is saying. And of course, the bigger uh, x is, the more it wants to go basically just towards zero. Okay. So this equation, um, you can actually solve uh, if you're interested in doing that. Um, the sort of formal calculus trick here would be to scale both sides by the uh, infinitesimals, right? So uh, what can you say? You can say dt equals minus dx over kx. This, of course, is totally formal, but then you can go back and check that the solution you got makes sense. And kind of integrate both sides. Um, notice here you have a 1 over x, so you're going to end up with a natural log when you integrate. Um, I'll let you do this uh, trick at home, um, but you can check that the solution of this ordinary differential equation is given in closed form. Now, one thing to be really clear about in our discussion right now, would I actually use Euler's method to solve x prime equals minus kx? Well, no, right? Because I have the solution. It's right here. There's, there's no reason why I wouldn't use it. Um, the reason that we're talking about it right now uh, is because it's something that we can call a model equation. And the, the basic idea here 
is that we're going to understand the behavior of our ODE solvers through the lens of seeing what it does on this very, very simple ODE. And so in particular, uh, if Euler's method works or fails on different instances, namely for different choices of the step size and K, we can kind of get some idea of the drawbacks and advantages of using this particular technique. So let's actually apply Euler's method to the uh, ordinary differential equation. So remember what that means. That means that I can think of x at time t plus h. I can approximate it. <laughs> That's the uh, <laughs> approximation sign today. Uh, uh, as x of t plus h times the derivative of x in time, which is given by our expression here. So minus k x, I guess, of t. All right, so let's, uh, let's basically gather the terms here. So we have two different x of t's, so we can factor that out. And what are we going to get? We're going to get 1 minus h k times x of t. Okay, so this is the formula for Euler's method applied to this super simple ordinary differential equation. Again, would I actually use this formula instead of the closed form one to solve this specific differential equation? No, but by comparing these two objects, we can get some idea of the accuracy and stability of Euler's method. Incidentally, by the magic of PowerPoint, uh, here's a nicer uh, version of exactly what I wrote down on the previous slide. So the basic idea here is that I'm going to solve x prime equals minus kx. By applying Euler's method that we talked about in our previous lecture, we get this expression uh, when we try to solve this ODE moving forward. Now, let's step back 10 feet and think about what this is telling us about life. Right? So x of t plus h is essentially some constant times x of t. So let's say that I take n time steps. So I get x of t plus nh. Well, essentially, I'm just going to multiply by that constant n times. So we actually have a closed form formula for exactly what Euler's method is going to do to integrate our ODE forward in time. But wait a second, these two formulas do not agree. Notice that the formula on the right hand side, there's no, there's no E in there. <laughs> so clearly something has gone a little bit wrong. And in fact, all kinds of crazy stuff can happen. So let's take a look at that constant, this magic number 1 minus hk, which seems to be hiding in all of these formulas. Now, we kind of expect Euler's method to work well or to be accurate when h is small, right? Because uh, when, when that's happening, um, we're taking these tiny time steps and we really haven't made that many mistakes. So in that case, this constant is close to 1. A little bit less than one, in fact, right? Because eight, uh, k is a positive number. But what happens if h is too big, right? Like I get a little bit greedy with my ordinary differential equation solver, and I want to predict like what happens, you know, a century from now using just one step of Euler integration. Not a good idea. Well, eventually, if h is big enough, this constant here becomes negative. And then sometimes it can become so negative that it's actually less than negative one, meaning that, okay, we know that our solution should be a decaying exponential, but when our constant is big enough, the opposite happens. So let's see a visualization of what's going on here. So here uh, is an illustration of Euler's method uh, taken with different step sizes h. And the magic number on our model equation to think about is this constant 1 minus hk. So we know from the previous slide that we have this formula here, right? That to get the next time step in our uh, simulation, we take the current time step and we just multiply it by a constant. 
That doesn't always happen in Euler's method, just specifically for this very simple ODE. So when this constant is between 0 and 1, that's the first case here. Well, the solution decays, right? It's uh, I'm multiplying by a constant between 0 and 1. Um, so every time I do that, I get closer and closer to 0. That's sort of the behavior that I would expect from my ordinary differential equation, right? It agrees with that ground truth formula uh, that we wrote on the previous slide. Now, let's say that I want to extrapolate to a bigger time using just one step. So now I choose a bigger h. Eventually, that 1 minus hk constant value becomes negative. So when that constant value is between minus 1 and 0, well, the absolute value of our constant is still less than 1, so it still eventually goes to 0 uh, if I use Euler's method and time step forward. But it does so by oscillating. So that's like this green path here. Notice that eventually it decays to 0, but it does that by zigzagging. This is not particularly representative of the solution of our ODE, what it should look like. And then finally, if h is so big that I'm less than negative 1, then the absolute value of this constant here is bigger than 1, and the solution to my ODE actually explodes, right? It gets bigger in magnitude in each step, which is not what's predicted by the um, ground truth. So what do I get out of this illustration, and what don't I? I mean, this is very important to think about. Um, for one thing, notice that the critical value here, somehow it's not just h, but it's the product of h and k. And that sort of makes sense. If you think of this ODE as governing a spring of zero length, right? the bigger the constant of the spring, the more stiff it is, and then somehow the more sensitive uh, your system is to um, the initial condition and how stretched out you are. Uh, so a different way of phrasing that is simply that if k is big, then h must be small. On the other hand, if I have a very weak spring, so basically, you know, I yank my spring out and it's just this itty bit of little force moving my system inward, then I can afford to take a pretty big step before my problem becomes uh, unstable. The other thing to notice about the discussion that we've made here is that none of it actually involves the accuracy of our ODE solver. All we're doing is saying, well, we know that the solution of this particular equation should decay to zero, so we'd like Euler's method to have similar behavior, um, but if we take too big of a time step, that doesn't happen. What we didn't say is that it decays to zero in a rate or a fashion that looks anything like the actual solution. So this is somehow a weaker criterion. We just don't want our system to explode. Um, and this is the difference between accuracy and stability. Right now I'm talking about stability, um, but of course, the other thing that we want to talk about is accuracy, and that also kind of wants h to be small, right? Because if I take small time steps, somehow Euler's method becomes more accurate. In any event, there is an important uh, keyword that you all should get out of today's lecture. Notice that if k is big, I have to take tiny, tiny time steps to resolve that motion. And again, the model I should use to think about that is just like a really, really stiff spring, right? Where if I pull it out a tiny bit, the force is so drastic, it wants this uh, particle to move really, really far. So there are all kinds of really hard to solve numerical systems out there in the simulation world. And in general, we give them this term here. This term comes from talking about springs, which is that our problem is numerically stiff. So a numerically stiff uh, problem is one for which you need little tiny time steps to resolve. Now, numerical stiff problems appear all over the place, and it's one of the biggest headaches in the numerical analysis universe. Um, so for example, uh, one of the most famous examples of a numerically stiff simulation problem involves simulating protein folding. So proteins are these really complicated objects. <laughs> I'm not a biologist, so I'm not even gonna attempt to explain the science. Um, but my understanding is that you have a bunch of different atoms or molecules that are being held together by forces that act on very different scales, and at both time scales, length scales, and so on, right? So there's some that very strongly bind particles to one another, and they vibrate at a very rapid rate in a very small amount of space. 
Then there are other sort of coarser ones that are slowly pushing the protein to fold at a macro level. Now, if I want to simulate all of these effects, unfortunately, oftentimes the stability and behavior of my numerical method is governed by the stiffest part. So even if I want to just resolve this like high scale uh, folding of my protein, which is happening over like some longer scale of time, the numerical uh, time step that I have to use in order to resolve the motion is much, 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 much smaller uh, thanks to uh, the different issues here. Okay, so the basic message here is that accuracy and stability are not the same. Um, when we talk about stiffness, uh, we're often talking about the stability of our system. And the idea is that at the very least, you want a small enough time step that your ODE solver doesn't explode. And then we can start talking about accuracy, which is does your ODE solver actually capture real life? Uh, and these are two different considerations that are both important. By the way, the relative importance of these two considerations really depends on the details of your situation. Um, so, for example, in a video game, it might be that you're really willing to put up with some bad quality physics. But if your physics becomes unstable, your whole video game collapses. So you cannot afford to have stability issues in your numerical system. And that's really tricky, especially in the video game environment, because you don't know how people are going to interact with your game ahead of time. On the other hand, in a movie studio where things are more controlled, um, it might be that actually stability is a little bit less important, right? So maybe I have some wild and crazy visual effects uh, set up and water is splashing every which way and there's explosions and things dropping into it and splashing and, you know, breaking apart and fracturing. And maybe I want, okay, so I don't want an unstable simulation, but maybe my simulation is only stable for like two seconds, but then something goes wrong. But the shot that I'm trying to make in my movie is only one and a half seconds long. That might actually be OK. <laughs> um, and moreover, I can try again if something went wrong with the simulation. Right. I only have to get it right one time. Um, so these are two very different universes um, and, and, and their priorities and uh, preferences for simulation behavior are, are quite different. Now, we've talked about how to analyze stability. Uh, the other thing we should talk about is how to analyze accuracy. Um, and that's actually a really interesting consideration and it depends a lot on the details of your solver. But there is one standard way, uh, at least in undergrad classes, that we can talk about the accuracy of an ODE solver um, in a pretty reasonable fashion. And that looks something like this. So let's actually do the accuracy analysis for the Euler method continuing with our, our sort of simple model. So what do we know? We know at the end of the day, we're trying to solve uh, this uh, problem here, right? We want to find x of t. So x is a function of time. And the typical way that people carry out accuracy analysis is to use a Taylor series. So I'm going to predict x at a base time t naught plus a time step h using the usual Taylor series, right? So uh, the zeroth order term in the Taylor series is just the uh, system at time t naught. The first order one is, you know, h times the derivative, then h squared over two times the second derivative and so on. Now, remember uh, that we actually know how to get the first derivative here, right? This is just f of x t naught. So let's say that I took this uh, entire expression and I truncated it. Do you recognize what this would be? This is actually Euler's method, right? What Euler's method does is it approximates x at time t naught plus h as x at time t naught plus h times the first derivative, which we can obtain from that function f. So if we want to understand the accuracy of Euler's method, essentially the question that we're trying to ask is what's the difference between Euler's method and the real world? And we can see that the biggest term in our Taylor series that's missing involves h squared. So one step of Euler's method 
incurs error that looks like h squared. What does that mean? Well, it means that if I take h and I divide it by two, then maybe the error per step divides by four, right? That's what the square is. Now we have to be a little bit careful with our accounting here. If I take h and divide it by two, I didn't simulate to the same time, right? I simulated for half the time. So I need to do twice as many steps. And if I multiply these two things together, the error divides by two. And that's what motivates uh, this terminology that we often use in the numerical world, which is we say that Euler's method is first order accurate. What that means is that essentially as I decay h, the error decays first order in h. Or a different way to put it is if I want 100 times more accuracy, I need 100 times more steps in my simulation. Now, let's pause here and note a piece of terminology that's confusing because I think that this is a pretty typical mistake that people make. A first order method in one time step incurs quadratic error. And why is that? Let's say that I want to simulate to time t and I have uh, steps of size h, then how many steps am I going to have to take? Well, it's equal to t over h. And so the basic point here is that I incur a 1 over h factor in my simulation um, because each of my individual time steps is smaller. And so that's, that's how I get to first order rather than second order for Euler's method. Okay, so now we know something about the accuracy and the stability of Euler's method. We know about the accuracy in general and the stability, at least on the model equation. That's a pretty typical a kind of simple analysis. But there's no reason why Euler's method has to be the only method that we use to solve ODEs, right? It's an approximation at the end of the day. And maybe there are other approximations that work better. And so we can ask this question, can we do better? And the answer is yes. There are entire textbooks filled with different techniques for doing better in uh, solving ODEs, but we're just going to talk about one or two. The good news is that they're often not that much more difficult to implement. It's just that there's a complex trade-off between accuracy, stability, and computation time. So here's one idea for how we might make Euler's method better. So Euler's method, what does it do? Euler's method evaluates my field, takes a positive step, and gets another point. Now, if Euler's method were really, really accurate, I would probably expect the derivative at my final step to be more or less the same as the derivative at where I started, right? Because otherwise, somehow something went wrong. I should be following the field at every step. So one idea might be to take a step in Euler's method, evaluate my field, and then try again using a better direction that somehow compensates for the difference between the two. So now I'm going to take these two direction vectors, maybe average them together, and then take a step along that new guy. This motivates a technique called the trapezoid method, which is what I've shown you here. So in the first step, the uh, trapezoid method essentially evaluates our field, right? Remember that, again, the equation we're trying to solve is x prime equals f of xt. And now there's a really sneaky thing that we can do, uh, which is as follows. So first of all, take a look right here. Notice that this expression, what is this? This is Euler's method, right? So this is what Euler would predict as x of t plus h um, by uh, Euler's method. But what am I going to do? I'm going to evaluate my field at that new time step, right? So remember that schematic we had on the previous slide. We first evaluated our field here to take a step of Euler. Now we evaluate it a second time uh, to see how much the field changed. And th so that's where we're going to get this F1, whereas we started with F0. And then the trapezoid method goes back to X0. But rather than stepping along this first direction, it's going to average these two directions together and step along that one instead. And so what you get is the expression down here on the bottom, which is a new approximation 
of x at time t naught plus h, where notice that now, rather than just having f naught, I have the average of f naught and f1 uh, as the field that I'm going to move along in my simulation. Now, we're going to omit the analysis in this class. It's not particularly difficult. We're just low on time. Um, but one thing that you can actually prove about this trapezoid method is that, well, Euler's method ends up with a quadratic term missing from the Taylor series. Trapezoid method actually ends up with a cubic term, meaning that trapezoid method for numerical integration of an ODE is second order accurate. Remember, the order is always one less than what you see in that error here. Um, moreover, uh, it's uh, oftentimes stable on that, that model problem unless you take a totally ginormous uh, time step. Understanding the differences between ODE solvers is kind of a difficult and often unclear matter, especially to students that haven't encountered this uh, area before. Um, it's some combination of an art and a science. <laughs> um, so the scientific part here is that, well, we got a better order accuracy than we had before. So it's tempting to stop and say, great, like I should just always use the trapezoid method. I should never use the Euler's method. But that's not necessarily true. And so oftentimes my advice when people are trying to choose between different solvers is to experiment with several of them because they're not so hard to code. Um, and here's the reason. Let's take a look at all of these expressions here. Notice that in order to carry out the trapezoid method, I needed to evaluate f two times, right? Once at time t naught, and then a second time using that extrapolated point from Euler's method. So what does that mean? Well, remember from our previous lecture, f can sometimes be really costly as a function to evaluate. So think about that gravitation example where f took like n squared time um, when n is the number of particles in the system. So in order to get the increased accuracy of the trapezoid method, um, I paid in the amount of computation. In fact, the amount of computation I did roughly would justify taking two steps of Euler's method, right? So that's where this analysis becomes really murky, right? I could afford in the same amount of CPU time to do more steps of Euler's method than I can afford to do more steps of the trapezoid method. Now, there are obviously many people that do very sophisticated analysis to compare these things theoretically, but my basic advice here is to just try more than one. These are just formulas. You can type them in uh, and see, like maybe Euler's method for my problem, which is really, really stiff, just doesn't work all that well. Um, but the trapezoid method allows me to take really big steps, and so that's actually a lot better. Or maybe my ODE is actually somehow very easy to solve, so the added computation expense of the trapezoid method is actually not worth it. It really depends on the problem. Now, trapezoid method isn't the end of the story. In fact, if you guys email me, I can send you an entire textbook worth of, of different ODE solvers. It's one of my favorites by uh, uh, Herr and Lubich. Uh, but in any event, um, even just in today's lecture, we can talk about a few alternatives. So a different thing that we could do is say, okay, maybe, in, now in the trapezoid method, I got some approximation of my field by evaluating it at two different points and averaging them together. A different way that I could do it would be to take half a time step, again, using Euler's method, because I, I don't know the solution of my equation. I can't actually trace out the integral curves evaluate the f function at that half time step, go back to my starting point, and then take a step there. So let's look at the formulas. This is called the midpoint method. So once again, I'll evaluate my field at x naught. Um, but now, rather than taking a full step of Euler's method, I'm going to evaluate a new object called f sub m, which takes half a step of Euler's method, Right? You can see it gets me to time t naught plus h over 2. The m here stands for midpoint. Oops, almost spilled my coffee. And now my final prediction of x of t naught plus h looks an awful lot like trapezoid method. It's just that rather than using that trapezoid direction, I'm using f sub m. And you can actually show that the midpoint method is also third order accurate. Does that mean midpoint and trapezoid have the same output? No, 
these are two different approximations of the solution to the ODE that just happen to agree in terms of roughly the amount of computation and the uh, error uh, that they induce. So again, this is pretty murky. You, you, you have to try more than one method to see which one works best for your particular problem. So if we compare them, again, the, the midpoint method takes a half an Euler step, evaluates our field, and then takes a full step using that midpoint field. The trapezoid method takes a full Euler step, evaluates our field, and then averages it. Um, and you can see that they ended up in two different places. Um, but both of them, as h goes to 0, uh, become quite close to each other, and they converge at a particular rate. So there's a whole cottage industry of people that come up with really clever ODE solvers. And I could talk about this stuff for days. I, I, I love this topic. And there's so many clever tricks that people use to integrate ODEs uh, in a smart, stable, and accurate fashion um, while reducing the amount of computation time. Um, for example, some of my favorite ODE integrators, you know, I've got like a poster of, 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 of Justin's favorite uh, ordinary differential equation integration algorithms. Um, my personal favorites are exponential integrators, which say, you know, maybe I don't know how to solve my ODE, but I know how to solve some other ODE that's kind of close by. So I'm just going to use that solution plus a bit of a compensating step to fix it. That's called an exponential integrator sometimes. There are also other ones that try to preserve different properties of your physical system. So for example, maybe I actually don't care that I'm accurate, but what I really care about is that my physics preserves energy as a function of time. Uh, so I'm going to build a numerical integrator that isn't necessarily that accurate, but doesn't increase or decrease energy. So that can be quite valuable, like in a video game where I don't know how long I'm going to run my simulation and so on. Now, because this is an undergrad graphics class, I should give you a default. Uh, the uh, default method that a lot of people use, uh, and you know, I think it's sort of best practice to try it in the absence of a reason to use a fancier integrator, is something called the RK4 integrator. Your instructor regularly confuses it with a football player, RG3. But in any event, um, the RK4 integrator is actually fourth order accurate and it's explicit. We're gonna talk more about what that means in a moment, but essentially an explicit integrator uh, means that it's just a bunch of formulas. Like I don't have to solve a system of equations. Uh, and the RK4 integrator, um, you can see that the formulas here are pretty crazy, but at the end of the day, they're just formulas you have to type in. It's kind of similar to the trapezoid method. And if you eyeball what's going on here, essentially K1 kind of looks like an Euler step then maybe I extrapolate a little bit. And what happens in the RK4 integrator is you extrapolate more than one time, right? So it's kind of like running trapezoid method and then using the result of trapezoid method to get yet another vector direction and, and iterating. Um, I actually managed to find a uh, visualization of RK4 that shows you kind of what it's trying to do. If any of you guys has a good intuition for how to read this visualization, um, I would love to hear it, uh, but alternatively, it's just a bunch of formulas you can type in and, and get a better integrator for your ODE. Um, the RK4 integrator is, I think, one of the most popular ones in, in graphics, or at least real-time graphics, um, because it's very easy to code. In fact, I think you'll do it in your assignment. I know you'll do it on your assignment. Um, and it has a fourth order accuracy, the stability isn't terrible, and, and so on. Okay, so of course, can we do even better? The answer is yes. Um, I encourage you guys to take a look at these course notes that we've linked on the slides. Um, I also happen to have written an entire numerical methods textbook, so a lot of this stuff is covered there. Um, essentially, the basic high-level point that you should all get out of this lecture is that there's a big trade-off between accuracy, stability, and computation time, and that every one of these solvers essentially hits a different point on those three axes. Um, so it's worth being aware of a few different integrators, you know, Euler's method being the simplest one, RK4 being much more accurate and, and kind of a reasonable amount of extra computation. Um, we're next going to talk about some methods that are implicit, but have a nice property, which is that they're stable, uh, which can also be important if the thing that you really care about is your simulation not exploding. Okay, so let's cover that next. So 
essentially, one thing to notice is that all of the numerical integrators we've talked about so far, um, they're basically just formulas. Um, a different class of numerical integrators for ODEs actually tries to solve a system of equations to predict what's going to happen next in time. These are sometimes called implicit or backward methods. And here's the basic idea. Um, let's say that I approximate dx dt using a divided difference, right? So that's what I see here, right? So these are approximately the same. Um, you know, it's just a difference in, in time steps divided by h rather than an infinitesimal thing. Now, we can actually derive Euler's method by plugging in this approximation for dx dt, plugging in x on the right-hand side, right, in our, our ODE, remember dx dt is f of x, and solving for xi plus 1, right? So in particular, if I multiply both sides by h, what am I going to get? I'll get xi plus 1 equals xi plus h times f of xi, uh, I guess you can say of t, it's a little redundant, t. And this is Euler's method. So this is yet another way to motivate the algorithm that we've already talked about, which is essentially uh, you did two things. On the left-hand side, you put in a particular approximation of the derivative of your system. And on the right-hand side, Notice that I had to evaluate it at xi, um, and that's what allowed us to get our solver here. But for fun, <laughs> one thing you might try is you might ask a different question, which is, what happens if I put in xi plus 1 on the right-hand side? Now, there's no reason why the left-hand side should be any more accurate than the right-hand side, right? Both of those are making a mistake, which is that f isn't really constant along the... Uh, integral curves of our ODE. But this right-hand side is what we might call implicit. And what does that mean? That means, remember that the unknown in our ODE solver is xi plus 1, right? Because essentially we know the current configuration and our job is to extrapolate to the next time step. Now the reason why Euler's method was so easy is that xi plus 1 only occurred in one place. So I could isolate it and write a formula, this one down here, for xi plus 1 in terms of the current configuration of my system. On the right-hand side, xi plus 1 appears twice, right? Once on the left of, of, of the equation and once on the right of the equation. So this expression is implicit. This is a system of equations. that I have to solve for xi plus 1. Now, initially, this feels kind of crazy, right? This is a lot more computational work that I'm going to have to do to obtain xi plus 1 from xi, right? On the left-hand side, it's just a formula. So, like, why the heck would I go to all the work to define a method where I have to actually solve an equation? But there's actually some advantage here. So, let's go back to our simple model equation, right? This is the, the one that we keep kind of studying. Um, when it comes to understanding stability. Okay, so maybe it's worth uh, redoing our computation for the forward Euler method again. Um, so remember that looks like xi plus 1 equals xi minus hkxi, or 1 minus hkxi, like that. So if I think of my first time step as time step 0, then I can say, well, xi really is 1 minus hk to the i. I'm not a big fan of using i as an index. I probably should have used like l or something times x0. And remember that in a couple slides ago, we essentially showed that the behavior of the Euler method depends a lot on this constant, right? When this constant is close to 1, it has the right behavior. As h gets too big, it starts to oscillate and eventually explodes. But now, let's do the same thing for the implicit Euler equation on the right-hand side. So now, what do we have? Well, the left-hand side is the same. 
But now I have to evaluate my derivative formula at a different point, namely xi plus one. So we have minus k times xi plus one. Now in general, ODEs are nonlinear, right? So I can't necessarily solve this system exactly. All I can do is solve it approximately. And um, we'll talk about some methods for how to do that. But for this particular model equation, because it's so simple, we actually can solve it exactly. So in particular, let's multiply both sides by h. So I have xi plus 1 minus xi equals minus hk xi plus 1. Now we can uh, group together all the xi plus 1s and all the xi's. So we have 1 plus hk times xi plus 1 equals xi. But remember, my unknown is, is this guy. So at the end of the day, I get xi plus 1 is equal to 1 plus hk to the minus 1, this is a constant, times xi. Or following a similar logic to the left-hand side, we can say, okay, by induction, xi is equal to 1 plus hk to the minus i times x0. Again, I'm not a big fan of using i's and exponents like that. Now, notice, first of all, these are two different formulas that both predict xi. That's fine. We've kind of made our peace with that, right? Like or, uh, trapezoid and so on would give us even more formulas you guys could work out on paper. But take a look at this constant here, right? So now the basic constant that's getting multiplied in some sense is 1 over 1 plus hk. What happens when h gets really, really big? Does this value ever go negative? No, it doesn't, right? It gets closer to 0, but it never goes negative. So what does that mean? Remember that when h is too huge on the left-hand side in forward Euler method, by the way, sometimes we call Euler's method forward Euler to distinguish it from backward Euler, which is what we're talking about now. When h got too big, eventually this thing became negative, and then uh, that led to oscillation. And if h got really big, not only would it oscillate, the magnitude would increase instead of decrease. Here, no matter how big h is, I never get that oscillatory behavior. And the constant only goes closer to zero. My system doesn't ever explode. So here's basically exactly the same formula that I gave you on the previous slide, just typed in, in nicer uh, <laughs> font, right? So, uh, oh, oops, I've been a little bit inconsistent about T's versus I's, but you guys are all smart enough to follow. The basic terminology that we use here is that the backward Euler method is unconditionally stable. What that means is that I can take h to be as big as I want, and this constant here will never explode. Well, I suppose the constant really cuts out xt. Okay, so for simulation, this is a great property to have, right? If I'm stable, you know, maybe I don't care about the accuracy of my solver so much. I can take ginormous steps in my simulation, um, and I'll get something. I'll get some motion. It just you know, it might, look good. It, might look, it might not look great, but it also won't explode. <laughs> uh, and that can be quite valuable. So, of course, the backward Euler method somehow got lucky on our model equation. We could actually solve it in closed form. You might ask the question of like, well, why don't we use backward Euler for everything? Um, and the answer is that oftentimes it's, it's, it's quite difficult to use. Um, so if you think of the visualization, remember that forward Euler just evaluates your field and takes a step along it. In backward Euler, you're kind of playing this game where you're saying, I'm fishing around for a new point xi plus 1, right? So as I move around xi plus 1, I'm going to look backward along the vector field. And my goal is to find an xi plus 1 where when I look backward, I get xi. That's a much harder task than just move forward along the field. And that's what makes this method implicit. There's a system of equations to solve. So you need numerical methods for solving systems of equations, but thankfully many of those are out there. Uh, and so you can use things like N Newton's method, not to be confused with Newton's laws, uh, 
uh, to solve implicit Euler systems in practice. Now, let's uh, do a little bit of comparison. So it turns out that um, these are a sort of high-level uh, discussion of how to understand difference between forward and backward Euler. The big pro of backward Euler or implicit Euler, it's the same term, is stability. I can take as big a time step as I want, at least on the model equation, by the way. I didn't show that in general, but it turns out to be often true. Uh, and the system never explodes. What are the cons? Well, one is that I have to solve a system of equations, and typically it's not as easy as the one that we did a few slides ago. And the more important con, the one that you guys should all remember, is that stability comes at the cost of numerical viscosity. I have a t-shirt that says that at home, you know? I, well, I guess I am at home. <laughs> um, but essentially the point here, uh, Remember that explicit Euler or forward Euler exploded if we took big time steps. Implicit Euler tends to have the opposite property. It tends to dampen or remove energy from our physical system. So sometimes when implicit solvers are integrated into graphic systems, maybe the game or, or the, the simulation for the movie or what have you will actually have to add artificial energy somewhere else in the system, like kind of randomly perturbed stuff to make it not look boring. The other thing that's worth knowing, uh, this one's not terribly surprising because the formulas are very close, is that the accuracy of implicit Euler actually matches that of forward Euler. So it's more stable, but it's equally accurate, and the computation time is much larger. So the value of implicit Euler comes for systems that are really, really stiff, where forward Euler would require a tiny, tiny time step to not explode, Backward Euler can take a much larger time step, making it more feasible to integrate these complicated systems. Okay, so that's the, the basic setup here. Um, so now, um, this is a quick recap. You've seen many different solvers, right? Forward, backward Euler. Um, those are sort of example of the contrast between implicit and uh, explicit solvers, uh, as well as RK4, um, which has a higher accuracy but it's still explicit and can suffer from stability issues. It's not always stable. So now we're gonna go back to modeling and say, well, now that we have this fancier ODE solver, what can we use it for? And there's all kinds of fun applications of this kind of thing. And this falls under the, the category of what we call mass spring modeling. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna build up big networks of springs and show that we can essentially use those as a means of capturing the motion of more complicated objects that we see in our everyday life. In practice, what this is going to allow us to do is to basically reuse our particle system code from the previous lecture to simulate things that are cloth. So we're not, you know, rendering it like a system of particles, but behind the scenes, it really is. So for example, let's say that we want to simulate a piece of string, or like a piece of thread, something that doesn't resist twisting motion all that much. Well, what could I do? One thing I could do is maybe my string is fixed at two ends or something. Um, I could take my string and approximate it with a polyline. And now I have to cook up some forces that try to simulate the dynamics that I observe in a string. Now, what do I observe in a string? Well, strings don't like to get longer or shorter. They just like to bend, right? So how could I simulate that with my discrete spring? Oh no, I already gave it away. String, <laughs> well, I could use springs, right? Springs also have the property that they wanna resist getting longer or shorter. So let's do a tiny amount of review from your physics class. Remember that there's something called Hooke's Law, which is used to calculate the force on a spring. So a spring has some rest length, L naught, and the force that a spring exerts between the particles it's connecting essentially it looks like a constant times the difference in lengths between the rest length, L naught, and the actual length of the spring. This is called Hooke's Law, right? So what does it say? It says if I pull the spring out too far, it wants to go in. If I compress, it wants to go out. And this seems super useful for that string simulation that I talked about, because string also kind of wants to remain at its own rest length. Here's a little more detail on Hooke's Law. Of course, I, I think you guys are all experts on this. Essentially, the magnitude of the force is some constant times the difference in lengths between the rest length and the true length of the spring, and the direction 
is between the two particles. I'm not going to even attempt to get the sign of that right. Uh, <laughs> if you notice your physical system exploding, you might try flipping the sign of your forces because that's a typical bug. Uh, and this is just a typical uh, force that shows up in Newtonian physics. So how could I simulate a piece of string? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to discretize my string as a sequence of particles. And I'm going to take every adjacent pair of particles and connect them with a spring. So now I have a big network of springs. And for example, if my string is at the actual length of the string, then um, the springs are perfectly happy and nothing will happen. Um, but uh, if I try and start pulling on it, uh, then I'll start to see interesting forces. Of course, this is really less of a piece of string and more of a rubber band. <laughs> there are more uh, high quality approximations out there, but this is the simplest way that I might simulate a piece of string and it's a pretty sensible one at that. So from string, it's not a big leap to talk about hair simulation. It's a sore topic for your instructor. But in any event, uh, I can think of a hair as also a big set of particles along a line here. Of course, hair somehow has some structural properties, right? So the uh, discretization of the, the string here really doesn't care about pivoting on these points here. It just wants the length to remain the same. Um, in uh, hair simulation, a typical thing to do might be, you know, if I hold out that initial segment of my hair, I don't think that I would think of the rest of the hair as just pivoting and making a straight line down. So we'll add some structural forces that try to uh, essentially counteract that, that particular motion, right? Um, so in other words, this angle between adjacent segments is one that you might want to add forces so that your hair kind of wants to be a straight line uh, in the absence of something acting on it, okay? Uh, there are all kinds of cool physical models for hair dynamics. Obviously, your hair is, I hope, not comprised of a bunch of springs, um, but you can actually get a reasonable approximation. Um, so one of the clever ways to do that with structural forces is to use that string thing that we did before, where every adjacent pair of particles is connected with a spring. And now every two particles away from each other are also connected by springs of a different rest length. Right? Obviously, the smaller the rest length here, the more curly your hair wants to be. Uh, and so this is just like kind of a nice clever hack uh, to get some chain of particles that looks kind of like a piece of curly hair. <clears throat> is this a great approximation? No. I encourage you guys all to dig through the SIGGRAPH conference and related literature for, for better ones. And notice that this is totally representative of this approach to physically based animation that we've been talking about, right? This is physically based, right? We've gone out into the world, we've looked at people's hair and then come up with a physical model built out of springs that kind of simulates the motion that we want. But of course, the reality is that your hair isn't composed of like five particles connected by springs. This is just an approximation that captures some of the qualitative aspects that we see. Incidentally, if you really like uh, hair simulation, there's all kinds of cool things that we're not going to talk about in this course. Actually, we cover them in the first lecture of 6838 because curves are fun. Um, there's a fun paper in Computer Graphics Universe from a few years back that <clears throat> talks about hair simulation using objects called uh, discrete elastic rods. Now, the basic model here, the challenge is that, let's say that I take a piece of string and I start twisting the endpoint. I'm looking around my desk for a piece of string. Unfortunately, I don't have one. Eventually, what's going to happen is that the string will buckle. It actually knows that you've twisted it along the outside. But the mass spring model that we talked about today really doesn't know how to capture that al twisting along the length of the string. Um, so this elastic rod model tries to account for that. Let's skip through this video to some fun uh, simulation results of the kinds of things that can happen. So here they're twisting the end of the string and by capturing and simulating that behavior properly, you get this cool behavior which the models that we've talked about wouldn't be able to capture because they don't know about twisting along the uh, string. Fun fact, this like weird shape that you're seeing here, I believe has a name. It's called a uh, plectoneme or something like that. <clears throat> 
Um, so there's a whole group of physicists that study these kinds of things. If you like this area, you get to play with real pieces of string too. <laughs> okay, so now that we've talked about string uh, and hair, let's talk about a different thing that we often want to capture in the simulation world, and that's cloth. Now, the basic way that we're going to simulate cloth is behind the scenes, we're going to have a triangle mesh, which is the cloth surface. And we're going to place little springs along all the edges of the triangle mesh. And the motivation here is that a piece of cloth resists stretching. Um, it also resists bending, which we'll talk about. But these little strings are also trying to resist stretching of the cloth, just in a giant network uh, worth of forces. So we'll talk about one model for cloth dynamics. Again, as with almost everything we talk about in physically based animation, many, many people have studied uh, cloth and there are all kinds of clever models out there. I actually used to work in this area a little bit. Um, but here's uh, one way that people do it, is to model cloth dynamics using a few different forces. There are structural forces, which are trying to enforce invariant properties. So in this case, like the, the cloth isn't too extensible, like I can't just stretch it out like a rubber sheet. There's deformation forces. So for example, some types of cloth, if I try to bend them out of the plane, um, they'll resist that kind of motion. Uh, and then there's a third type of force like gravity, which are just external stuff acting on the cloth. So here's one of the early cloth models. This is the one that you guys will implement on your homework. Uh, and it tries to capture all of these different deformation mo modes uh, in different spring forces, which is pretty cool. Um, so for example, um, Essentially, what we're going to do is model our cloth as a big grid of particles, right? That's what you see here. And now we're going to make all kinds of springs going every which way to enforce different uh, forces that we think are going to govern the cloth dynamics. So, for example, we're going to add structural springs. That's like the vertical and horizontal ones here. And these are essentially trying to resist in-plane uh, stretching. And then we can add different types of deformation springs. Uh, and these are the ones that are going to prevent the cloth from just totally collapsing flat. Um, so for example, you could add diagonal ones. Uh, this particular 1995 paper calls these uh, shear springs and flexion springs, which are kind of like making a stiff board uh, rather than a uh, piece of cloth. Again, this is physically based modeling. We can add any springs that we want test our physical system, and if it looks like the physics we're trying to capture, that's great. We're not physicists. We're not going to use this to actually predict experiments. Um, there's all kinds of art to this, which is a little bit tricky. Um, you need to set the stiffness of your spring, like that constant K, uh, to get realistic motion, right? You don't want your spring, like your, your, your cloth, rapidly vibrating as a function of time. Um, notice that the forces here, this is like a big, giant network of springs, so all of the particles are, are depending on each other uh, to figure out their forces in motion as a function of time. That's a good thing for cloth. If that weren't true, something clearly went wrong. But unlike gravitation, um, it has this interesting property that it's sparse, right? The, essentially, the forces on a particle here um, are really just dependent on like some grid of nearby particles, right? Something like that. Um, so you don't need to do n squared computation. It's still an order n to compute pairwise forces. Of course, there's some details here. So for example, um, contact is really critical. Like I don't want to just keep dropping cloth and letting it flutter around. Um, the simplest contact uh, might be to like hang a curtain up. In which case, what do you do? Well, you just take like the two corners of your cloth and just set the total force to zero. Right? Because you know that the nails holding your curtain up are just canceling out any other forces. There are other forces out there. Um, a challenge problem for your homework, so an optional extra credit would be to simulate the cloth kind of passing over a ball uh, that's moving underneath it. That's much trickier and involves detecting and uh, resolving contact between uh, the cloth and this other object. But we can add other forces too, gravity, wind, and so on. Those are not so bad. Of course, uh, one thing you might notice, you know, there are two different ways you could handle the corner points of the cloth. One would be to compute all the forces on the corner and then make a new force, which is just minus all of those. <laughs> or you could just ignore the corner and say the force is zero because you know that that's what's going to happen at the end of the day. <laughs>
So here's an example of what cloth looks like from this simulation. So here uh, we pin this little grid on the corners and we allow our forward uh, time integrator to predict what happens. And indeed, it kind of has a clothiness <laughs> to uh, the final pose of this shape. Um, this uh, particular visualization uses kind of exaggerated parameters to show you the downsides of using this simple model. Is that I don't think that cloth stretches out nearly as much as this particular system. Um, so a different way of, of, of putting it is that these, uh, oh no, this should say springs. Um, these springs are not stiff enough. Um, but of course, what's the trade-off here? Well, if I made my springs uh, stiffer, then I would need a smaller time step to resolve my animation, and eventually it might not be real time anymore. Uh, in fact, uh, for movies, typically cloth is solved not just with forward Euler or an explicit method, but actually um, implicit integrators. If you like this kind of thing, there's a research paper which is really famous. Um, it also has a really cute title, so I like it, where they say, large steps in cloth simulation, um, where essentially they just propose using uh, an implicit integrator to resolve cloth motion, and it allows them to take very big steps in time, which is cool. Um, it's also cute because the title of the paper has two meanings, right? It's large steps because it's an implicit solver. It can take big steps, but it's also a big step forward in the cloth simulation world. I, I like that. Um, one other thing that's worth noting is a challenge in discretization. We didn't exactly derive the motion of this piece of cloth from first principles. We just started sticking springs every which way <laughs> and hoping that we got it right and empirically observing that actually this model is pretty reasonable. Um, one property that people like in physics and in computer graphics, uh, sometimes we say it's like convergence under refinement. Uh, but the basic point here is that if I used a denser grid of smaller springs, somehow I would expect to capture the behavior better. Um, but a priori, this model doesn't have that property. Um, and it actually takes a lot of work to design a scheme that's mostly oblivious to discretization. So in order to do that, typically what people do is actually try to work out the physics of cloth and then approximate it, in which case you have more of a hope of having this nice uh, convergence property rather than just kind of hoping that it's true from your made up network of, of springs. And again, the really key issue to remember here is that there's a stiffness challenge. Um, cloth doesn't stretch nearly this much, but if I make my K bigger, in other words, if I want my cloth to resist uh, stretching, <coughs> then uh, Euler essentially has a limit telling you the upper time step that you can use before your system explodes. Right? And so, you know, remembering the, from beginning of today's lecture, uh, the stiffer you make your cloth, you know, the more difficult it'll be to simulate. And actually, that really makes sense, right? I mean, if you think about stiff springs uh, specifically, um, you know, you can think about there being this four-dimensional phase space, like two particles and their velocities. Then we can actually begin to plot what the spring force looks like. Roughly, it's like this uh, 3D thing here. This is a really ugly <laughs> visualization, but the, the key point here is that the height is the magnitude of the spring force. And of course, as I increase my spring constant, that height gets really tall really fast, and it's very easy to cross this line down the middle where the force changes sign, right? So in a really bad uh, spring simulation, what's gonna happen is I take a big time step and I actually extrapolate past minus the current value, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. That's bad news. Uh, and so if you uh, plot the, uh, the admissible region for your simulation, it's really, really small. And so that's why people often do lots of different tricks to make cloth inextensible. Um, one would be to use an implicit integrator like we've talked about. Another might be to take a step of forward Euler and then, as a post-processing step, go back and try to fix the cloth to look a little bit more like what we know it should. Right? So maybe my springs extended too much in my forward Euler step, but I know that my springs should basically stay the same length as a function of time. Um, so in constrained simulation, we'll kind of take that time step forward and then kick it back onto the set of constraints that we know are true. Right? So a very typical setup would be 
that you kind of ping pong back and forth between taking a step of your integrator and then projecting it back down onto the constraints like that your cloth doesn't stretch out more than some amount. This is computationally expensive, um, but it can work quite well in practice uh, and it kind of makes sense uh, physically. It's also oftentimes not so bad to prove that this is, is an effective technique uh, mathematically, that like, you know, this can work for actual uh, physical simulations that are trying to capture the real world. But the basic point here is that like the constraints of the physical universe often add to the stiffness of our numerical integrators, and um, that can make things quite difficult in practice. Okay. Um, by the way, hopefully you guys have noticed by now that our lectures kind of alternate between a few concrete things, you know, like uh, defining different ODE integrators, and then a big grab bag of topics that you're supposed to understand at a high level. Um, and we're definitely in that second part of our lecture right now, right? So I'm just summarizing and helping you to understand some of the challenges. Um, but of course, you're not responsible for state-of-the-art methods for resolving some of the problems that we're going to mention. Speaking of which, uh, here's another big challenge, is that cloth has all kinds of points of contact, right? So if you look at this piece of cloth here, oh, um, you can see that it's making contact with the ground. Um, more subtly, it's making contact with itself. And that can be really tough, because remember that we talked about the fact that our cloth simulation only involved little local networks of springs. It wasn't like planet simulation but the computation time would go through the roof if I had to check every pair of points on my cloth to make sure that they don't interpenetrate with one another. And so in order to really simulate a piece of cloth, I need to efficiently detect collision with other objects and with the, the cloth itself and numerically resolve what should happen um, when there is a collision. And that can be super tough. This is an advanced topic. So for instance, um, if you take a look at this configuration down here, the cloth is like folded over on itself many, many times. Um, and so what can happen is like, let's say that I have a piece of cloth that is stacked up like that, like a towel, <laughs> you know, and I simulate it forward. So then this thing like maybe dips underneath. Well, what might happen is if I resolve it in a bad way, it might dip above the next layer of cloth. And so that would be equally bad. And so resolving all the constraints at one time is super tough problem and one that, that really professional graphics people have to worry about quite a bit. Um, but oftentimes they're, they're successful. So for instance, here you can see, uh, uh, what's his face? <laughs> Yoda <laughs> moving around with a pretty uh, bendy uh, frock here and, and doing perfectly fine. Uh, I've included a bunch of links in the slides to actually pretty dated papers at this point on the uh, cloth simulation uh, topic. I'm including these ones because I think they're easier to read. But every year, if you go to the ACM SIGGRAPH conference, you'll see new papers on this topic. Um, and with some really impressive results, too. So, for instance, here's a simulation of cloth from a, a group at Sanford that studies these problems. And you can see some extremely detailed motion, collisions, you know, sharp folds and so on. And all of this is happening without the simulation exploding. Eventually it slips off the side. Apparently the friction was not very high here. <laughs> but uh, that's even more impressive because you can see uh, the cloth intersecting itself a bunch. Or not intersecting itself. The, the collision detection here is good. As a final note, uh, before we move from simulation to the next topic, I thought I would uh, really quickly note that abstraction and object-oriented programming are really nicely compatible with uh, what we've been talking about. Um, this is a little bit orthogonal to our previous discussion, but essentially it's, it's, it's worth a, a bit of, of, of lecture time. Um, so one of the nice abstractions that we can do in a physically-based animation system is to separate out the physics and the numerical methods used to integrate the physics. Now, in more advanced systems, these things get tangled together a little bit, like when you have collision and so on. Um, but in this course, uh, you can really do them separately. Right? So we could have a class for the particle system, a different one for the time stepper, and to have them communicate by abstract functions, rather than like the time stepper worrying about whether you're simulating gravity or uh, springs or, or some other motion. Um, so, for instance, here's a kind of a typical story. Your particle system might tell the time stepper how many dimensions there are in the phase space, right? Because that's a piece of information they both need. 
the particle system has a way to read and write the state of the system and to evaluate the, the motion, right? The, the, the ODE, right-hand side. And then the time stepper can use that right-hand side and actually advance the state. So in kind of sort of pseudocode, sort of C++, um, here's what that might look like. So you could have a class for your particle system. Um, so this is basically the class that's holding the set of particles, computing the forces, and so on. It doesn't know how to solve the numerical system, but it does know everything about the state, right? So like the dimensionality, um, the positions, the velocities, forces, masses, and so on. Then your time stepper uh, class could be really simple. Like it might just take a particle system and a time step and modify the, par uh, the particle system to be that time step forward in time. Uh, so for example, here would be a forward Euler one where what do you do? In forward Euler, you compute the velocities and positions. Um, now you can get, actually, I guess the terminology here isn't great. It's not really the forces. It's the right-hand side of your ODE. Well, actually, no, I take it back. Um, in this case, we've written it specifically for, for solving F equals MA. So this really does compute the forces. And now the forward Euler step is here. So uh, in this particular setup, we're really oriented for a physical system. So we're advancing both the velocities and accelerations using Newton's laws, uh, using forward Euler. Uh, I think in your assignment, uh, you do this reduction to first order, and then you have an abstract forward Euler uh, method that does not treat velocity and acceleration separately. Um, there's a debate as to whether that's the right move if you know you're only gonna simulate physics, right? Because maybe there are better solvers that solve the second order problem um, specifically. But the nice thing is that, you know, now if I wanna experiment with midpoint instead of forward Euler, I can just make a different class um, that also extends time stepper, but just uses those new midpoint formulas uh, and everything else remains the same. So like here's our particle system uh, simulation. We set up our time stepper and our particle system and essentially just iteratively take a bunch of steps. If I now wanted to play with the midpoint solver, I could do that by just dropping it in here. By the way, those of you who do <laughs> deep learning, you know, you've played with PyTorch and TensorFlow. This is, looks an awful, it looks pretty familiar, right? So um, for instance, maybe you want to replace gradient descent with atom or something like that. Um, that's sort of orthogonalized with the uh, back propagation method that you're using to actually compute the gradients. This is exactly the same kind of um, division of, of labor in your, your object-oriented programming. So this lecture concludes our discussion of animation uh, in 6837. Uh, so starting next time, we're going to move on to rendering, uh, which of course is a core topic in our course. Um, as a quick recap, we've talked about lots of different techniques, including keyframe-based animation and how to link that to triangle meshes using skinning. We talked a little bit about procedural animation. There's plenty more to be done there. Uh, and then had two lectures on physically based animation where the goal wasn't to get the physics correct. Can't stress that enough. But rather, uh, the goal was to get phenomena that looked kind of like physics. And the way that we did that was by building up big networks of particles that are like little pieces of our physical system and cooking up forces that capture some qualitative aspects of the dynamics that we like. Then, once we uh, wrote down those particle systems and the differential equations that govern them, uh, we talked about many different ODE solvers for actually stepping these things forward in time. Everything from forward and backward Euler to RK4 uh, and a few things in between. So with that, uh, we've made it through the next part of our course and next time we'll get started on rendering.